What's up everybody? It's Carpo here and um, it's February something 2014. I'd like to share a book with y'all. <laughs> I um, I go down to Goodwill sometimes and I'll pick out a good book something that I find that looks old and I usually find one or two when I go that uh, grab my eye. Now today my choice is which I got two older books, actually one's from a th uh, 43 and one's from 19, I think it's 1932 originally, but it was a reprint from 1958. Um, the first one I got, which is, I know, after all the talk I do about Christianity, yes I do read Christian texts, this one's called The Earliest Gospel. And uh, of course I'm not a Christian, <laughs> you all know that, but uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting, it's got, uh, yeah, it's 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 a uh, Mark's Gospel, the long least the least popular of the four for public and private reading, leaped into the spotlight for serious students of the Bible. Blah blah blah, and it's actually interesting because it has this inset. Uh, it's actually like taped in, but um, uh, it's from 1943 during the war, and um, it's very interesting uh, concepts and, and interpretations, I guess, of that particular book, which. I, I'll take any religious text and read it just for the knowledge of it, to have it. This one I found was very interesting. It's called Words to Live By. And it's a rather thin book. And it's a 1958 reprint of a 1945 book. And the acknowledgement, it says, To my wife, who taught me that philosophy is not just a textbook word, but the path to intensified love, intensified living, and intensified common sense. Okay, so, um... What it is, I'm going to read this to you guys because uh, this is, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to do readings from this book. Actually, I'm going to show this part. It's kind of cool. So it's words to live by and then on the inside cover it says man and himself. Man and his God. Man and his society. <laughs> Philosophy in the making. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's a pretty cool book. So I'm going to read the foreword to it so you understand what it's about. It's a bunch of little, uh, very small, short writings by people from around the world, uh, that, around the country at least. I'm not sure. I, I just got it and I haven't really read it yet, but the first part I read I had to share. <coughs> so I'll read the quick introduction. This book is the flowering of an idea which began as an experiment and then turned into a rare adventure. It started this way. Some time ago, I was reading a wise, good, quiet book by David Grayson called Under My Elm, in which this gentle philosopher told stories about rural life in his New England village with his country neighbors. It was a strangely restful book to read, especially in that year, 1945, when everybody was talking tensely about the end of our era and the doom of civilization. Sounds very familiar. One chapter appealed to me especially. In it, Grayson described an old farmer neighbor who was a kind of walking anthology. Whenever he ran across some bit of verse, or prose, he liked, this rural collector preserved it, slipped the words inside his hat band, to be tacked later upon his granary wall, or the partitions of his horse barn. I thought afterward, Grayson wrote, as I tramped, tramped down the town road, how most of us have collections of sayings we live by. I believe it would be difficult to find an adult human being who hasn't a saying or two, or more, that he is saving because it expresses something vital. That chance paragraph from David Grayson's Amherst study sent me to planning a fascinating voyage of discovery, not into barns and granaries, but into the minds and hearts of many people during a period when our world was seemingly plunged into doubt, pessimism, and fear. The quest was to be an editorial venture, for I believed that words which had caught the imagination of one man or woman should be shared with others in the pages of This Week magazine, where nine million families of men and women could make them part of their lives. The first step was to select a list of people who, through their achievements, were what the world regarded as successful. Then, to each of them went a letter which read like this. There are times when millions of Americans are deeply disturbed and many of them are unhappy. We are surrounded by all the comforts of machine age, and yet we have somehow lost our sense in the meaning and purpose of beauty in life. Perhaps, possibly you have faced the same problem. Perhaps you have found some words to live by and treasured them because they say something to which you regard as vital. The appeal touched a rich source of inspiration, 
For several years, each issue of This Week was opened with words which came in response to my letters, and which flowed out to bring hope and comfort to others. At first, each selection and the comment which accompanied it seemed to be only random thought. Pleasant enough, often inspiring, but with no general significance. But, as the weeks went by, and the contributions kept coming in, I suddenly realized that here, in the truest sense, was philosophy in the making. One by one, the people of our time were bringing to me the wisdom gleaned from their own experience and living. Placed all together, these fragments suddenly fell into a thrilling pattern, a rich mosaic, a way of life for our time. Here, to start with, is one group of men and women speaking about the things which affect man in relation to himself, his happiness, success, fulfillment. Here is another group speaking of man and his society, all the things which go to make up a free and decent way of life. And here is a group who speak of the most important subject of all, man and his relation to God. Man and himself, man and society, man and God. These are the three elements of living. In this book, a group of men and women talk about them in terms of their own experience, their own wisdom achieved through trial and error. A professional philosopher, no doubt, could find many flaws and lapses in the sections which follow. Yet, I present them without apology. On these pages, you will meet the people who reveal, in their words to live by, what they are feeling and thinking and believing in this atomic age. With them, I hope you will recapture, as I have done, a sense of courage and enduring confidence in the future which lies beyond the uneasy clouds of our time. William Nichols. So, I hope you, I, I hope that wasn't too much. I hope you ascertained. He's basically sent out these um, <clears throat> letters and he sent out, you know, saying that he wanted words from people, men and women, who were working class people. And uh, people, or, and people also who were considered successful. So, words of wisdom for success. You know, these are these are some of these uh, words and terms that probably come through history. You know, we've uh, we're still using them in different different structures now. <coughs> so, the part one is called man and himself, and it has four parts to it. One is called enjoying life. The next one is called the road to success third is called some virtues and the fourth is called some vices and <clears throat> I was gonna I'm gonna open it up with this one I, I really wanted to read because I find this one uh, just really hit home and this is what made me decide to do this and each one has a, a little thing on morals and then it has a little saying a little quote that the person sent and then an explanation it's a couple pages long about that quote so the first one is called on Morals by Donald Colross Petey, author and naturalist. And the quote is, If your morals make you dreary, depend upon it, they are wrong. Robert Louis Stevenson. Now, I guess let's see. The author and naturalist. Okay, so the, the thing is by Donald but the saying is by Robert Louis Stevenson. Um, and here's the explanation that goes. I have long been delighted by this warning from the gallant prophet of the lively creed which declares that to be happy, if you possibly can, is a first duty to others. How the world has suffered from the dreary moralists, those gloomy souls who want to make other people good rather than happy. They have darkened the lives of children with threats of hellfire, hanged the witches at Salem, and persecuted thousands. Today, they counsel paralyzing doubt in a world that desperately needs the strength of heart. So I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to go back to, uh, in part two, I'm going to reread that and kind of get into the actual thing. So um, I'm going to start a series and do this, because I think it would be really cool. Some of these are really cool quotes, and I'm hoping I can learn from them too. So um, peace out. I'll see you next time.